I'm Riley Reese. This is the Sophia Unfiltered podcast, where we bring together thought leaders, wellness entrepreneurs, makers, and emerging health leaders. We're here to have raw, unfiltered conversations because sharing your stories has the power to change lives, help others heal, and transform the way we take care of ourselves. Here we go. everyone and welcome back to another episode of Sophia Unfiltered. I'm Riley, your host, and joining me today is Michelle, our co-host. Also joining today by our special guest, Dr. Drew Timmermans. He's a naturopathic doctor who specializes in non-surgical treatments for chronic musculoskeletal and nerve pain with a focus on regenerative injection therapy. He's the co-founder of Regenerative Performance located in Arizona, where he employs advanced techniques such as perineural injection therapy, platelet-rich plasma, and scar therapy, among others. Dr. Timmermans earned his naturopathic medical degree from Sonoran University. He completed his residency in regenerative medicine and integrative pain management. His holistic approach emphasizes stimulating the body's innate healing capabilities, offering personalized injection treatments tailored to each patient's specific pain issues. Everybody, I know Michelle is even more excited than I am to welcome him, so I will let her take over. Michelle, the floor is yours. Welcome. And uh, Dr. Timmermans, the reason that we brought you on is I actually had a consult with you over the phone. I'm one of your intranet uh, Instagram groupies. I don't know how, you know, the algorithm brought us together, but I started watching the videos you were posting and I felt like you were talking right to me. And then it wasn't just the things you were saying, you were also backing it up like you're actually doing the work. And so doing the work, you're testing out theories, you're seeing people get better. And so I was watching everything you were putting out. And that's why I really wanted you to come on today and talk to our listeners and let them know about all the great work that you're doing. So welcome. And I'm just curious, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and and how you got to be where you are. Yeah. So um, originally from Canada, I relocated uh, out here to Arizona back in 2013. So I was in a car accident in 2012. And then within a period of about four weeks, I ended up herniating two of my discs. And that kind of uh, shut down my track and field career in Canada at the time and uh, kind of really uh, put me on the path that, uh, that led me to where I am now. And I, so I struggled with having back pain for several years. I got exposed to naturopathic medicine as when I was a personal trainer, kind of in between, because I had originally thought about going to med school, was planning on going to traditional allopathic med school. Wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do there, but I knew that that was medicine was the path that I wanted to take. And so in between undergrad and then actually applying and kind of going to med school, I kind of discovered naturopathic medicine through a client of mine when I was personal training. And that really just, it floored me, you know, to, to say the least, because the principles of naturopathic medicine are just what I believe in terms of like what health and medicine should be. And so I kind of pivoted my path there um, and then went and applied at various naturopathic schools, ended up down here in Arizona, and then just got exposed to the regenerative medicine, PRP injections, stem cell therapy, things like that. I had my first PRP injection done on my low back in 2015. At that point, I was still having chronic pain from my low back. Nothing had really yeah, permanently moved the needle on that. And uh, three months later, I was pain free and I was back in the gym and I, and it was just like, holy cow, like this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And ever since 2015, my sole focus has been on helping people who have mostly chronic back pain. That's the biggest thing that we treat here in our practice, but we also treat knees and shoulders and ankles and all that stuff. And, um, that's just really what led me here. Wow, so powerful to have a doctor that also has experienced chronic pain because I feel like that really lights the fire under you to want to help people get better when you know chronic pain. It's like, oh, absolutely not. Or am I going to let you keep living like this? Yeah, yeah. It, it allows me to be able to relate to people a lot better. Um, you know, I've had a lot of patients tell me, you know, you know, they've seen other physicians and stuff like that. And usually these are your insurance-based docs who they get, you know, 10 minutes tops with them. And it just feels cold and it's just like, oh, suck it up or, you know, oh, you're just going to have to deal with this, get over it. And it's just, it's not a good way to approach chronic pain because those people are already suffering. 
and then they feel like they're being gaslit by medical providers by saying, oh, this is it. There's nothing wrong with your MRI. This isn't, you know, this is just in your head, you know, go to, go to therapy. And it's just not a good way to approach it. And so, yeah, really being able to connect with my patients because I've been through it is really helpful. Dr. Tamer Vince, just for our listeners really fast, can you just give us a little bit of your perspective on naturopathic medicine for those who may not be familiar with this, with this field? Yeah, of course. So here in the U.S., the kind of two main um, paths for most people who go to med school is allopathic med school, which gives you the credentials MD or medical doctor, and osteopathic medical school, which gives you the credentials DO or doctor of osteopathy. There is a third branch called naturopathic medicine, which our credentials are then going to be MD. And there are a lot of overlaps between the other uh, types of physicians, but there's also a lot of differences. I think the, the core difference is that our approach is really trying to figure out what is the root cause of why things are happening, whether that's chronic pain or something like high blood pressure or, uh, or diabetes or something else to that effect. Um, and then we are also trying to use the body to help to heal itself or to regulate symptoms as opposed to just relying on pharmaceutical medications. Within naturopathic medicine, you're going to have a, a wide scope of providers in the sense of you might have some people who only use herbs and supplements and uh, lifestyle and exercise to treat chronic disease. And then you're going to have some who might be a little more on the integrative or some people call it functional medicine, where it's a, it's a nice blend of using herbs and supplements and lifestyle, but then also understanding when medications can actually be really beneficial. And so one of the other big differences is that natural doctors are not trained in trauma settings. We're not surgeons, uh, none of those types of things. And so, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not found in hospitals. We're not in emergency rooms or trauma centers or anything like that, because that's not part of our training where we really specialize is that the gap with the conventional system, which is chronic disease. It's chronic pain. It's chronic infections. It's all these things where people are suffering for decades and the traditional medical system just goes, well, We'll just try this other medication for you. And it's just this continuous cycle where you're just trying to manage symptoms where we're actually looking to try and address the root cause. So we still go through four years of medical school. It's a different medical school than the MDs and the DOs go through. But there's, again, a lot of overlap. We still take pharmacology. We still take infectious disease. We still take a lot of the science classes that, that MDs and DOs will, and we still learn how to prescribe those medications and those scenarios and things like that. But we also learn how to, like, what can we do before we get to that stage? And that's where the, the herbs and the lifestyle and the nutrition can all kind of factor in. Now, the one last thing I want to say is that natural like medicine is not licensed in all states at this time point. And so there are some states such as here in Arizona where we are licensed physicians. So I have a DEA number, I'm registered with the state, all of those things that allow me to use the title of physician or doctor because that is a protected term. There are other states where that hasn't happened yet, either because um, just the, the push hasn't been made or they're just still in the process in, on the legislative side to get licensure. And so in some states, some people can call themselves a naturopath or even a naturopathic physician, but they're not, they have not gone through the four years of an accredited medical school. They have not sat for their licensing exams. Um, and so they, they might have only done, you know, an 18 month online course, never training real patients and things like that. Um, and so the, what I say is if anyone is not sure what their state laws are, if they go to naturopathic.org, you can then look up are doctors licensed in my state and they have a map and they show you all those types of things so that people can get educated on, hey, if somebody says they're not trying to doctor in my state, whether that's Colorado or Florida or New Hampshire, wherever, then they can verify that, oh, yes, if they say doctor, then they have gone through those things or no, it's not licensed here. Then you just have to be careful. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, Riley, because I, I just noticed that there's something different about naturopaths that you're searching down the root cause, and, and you explain that in in your explanation of what a naturopath does. But I really feel like it's the whole body, looking at the whole body, 
and getting really curious about, well, why is this happening? Instead of, oh, you're having a headache here. This knocks out a headache. Take this. It's like, but why are you having headaches? The human body is not designed to have headaches every day. So let's get curious about what's going on. And I also love the way that you're empowering your patients. It's like you do what you do. But, you know, if I'm your patient, then there's a whole lot that I can do that I can take into my hands right now. Like even somebody listening to this and if they've got chronic pain of any type, what are I I listen to it all the time because I listen to your Instagram reels all the time. But for our audience that doesn't know and doesn't follow you yet, because I know they're all going to want to. What are those things that you're suggesting to your patients that they can do to really stack the, the deck in their favor? Yeah, so the biggest areas that I try to focus on when educating the public or even our patients on what they can do, it's in the realms of sleep, nutrition, hydration, exercise, and then this kind of broad term of, you know, connectedness or mindfulness, or some people for that, it's going to be spirituality, but basically kind of the the mental emotional side. And so you know, I think probably the biggest needle movers in terms of things that people can do that have the biggest impact on chronic pain in a short amount of time is going to be in the realm of nutrition. And so that is reducing the amount of processed foods people are eating. One thing we've really noticed is this also includes reducing like how much you eat out. Now, this doesn't have to be like, hey, stop going to fast food places. I won't, don't want any lawsuits, so I won't name any, uh, but we can all think of some. But sometimes even uh, even too is just going out and eating at restaurants because sometimes there's a lot of seed oils that are in, you know, that that places are using in their cooking and stuff like that that may not be agreeing with some people, increasing some chronic inflammation, and that can change how your brain is perceiving pain. And so a reduction in processed foods, eating more foods that are found in nature, so fruits, vegetables, all that type of stuff. And then also a lot of people are just not eating enough protein doesn't necessarily have to be animal protein. I know some people choose not to eat animal protein and that's well and fine if that's your personal choice, but protein still needs to be in our diet and it's still really important to make sure we're getting enough of that. Most people are also chronically dehydrated. And part of that is that most people are drinking really crappy water. Um, They're drinking water that's been depleted of a lot of minerals. And when we drink water that does not have good mineral content in it, it actually more easily goes through us. So Those are the people where they feel like they're drinking a whole bunch of water and they're peeing all day long. Those people actually probably need a little bit of sea salt, usually is what we use, the Redmond sea salt added into their water or to drink mineral water that you can just purchase at the store. Those are probably two big ones. And then, you know, a lot of people are afraid of exercise. And I think that that has a a big impact because general movement and exercise is going to be really, really important for getting blood flow to areas that have chronic pain. And one of the things I've been really pushing uh, a lot more probably the last six months is this idea that you can exercise with chronic pain and that's actually okay in some people. Some people get in this, this thought process of, oh, if my back hurts and I go for a walk and my back hurts, I shouldn't be going out for a walk because my back is hurting. But there's actually some key things that we want to look at to say, okay, is if your back pain is not becoming unbearable, if you're not losing strength or range of motion, and if your back pain goes back down to baseline within 24 hours, then it's actually okay that you're having a little bit increase in pain when you're doing exercise because your brain just might be sensitive to movements in that area. But doing that over time can actually be really, really beneficial, helping to desensitize the brain. But exercise and even just generalized movement is so crucial because healing is much harder in areas that don't get great blood flow. And when we're not exercising and we're sitting or laying down all day long, we're not getting good blood flow to area like tendons, ligaments, our discs, our cartilage, that type of stuff. And it's only through exercise that we get to increase that blood flow. And so that's why we make a big push for exercise. Those are probably the, I would say, the three kind of main things that I think people could start doing that relatively safe and easy to implement once you kind of get a few things dialed in, especially with the nutrition. I love that. So those are things that we could make that choice with our next meal. We could add some 
uh, salt to our water, some real, that's Redmond real salt. Is that from the salt mines? Yeah. Love that stuff. I like the lemon lime. It tastes like Gatorade. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the water, you're right. The quality of our water is so important. That's been a game changer for me. And then could you say more about the seed oils? Like, I guess the only one that's coming to my mind is sesame seed, but yeah, so, you know, and canola is probably, I mean, it's not even really a seed oil at that point, but there are a lot of, there's some emerging evidence out there that the, um, the, the types of oils that we are taking in are going to have a negative impact on our cell membrane, and that's going to change how different enzymes come in and es essentially help us to deal with inflammation. And so our cells are more likely to be in an inflammatory state if we have a high content of omega-6 oils that are present in that cell membrane. And then a lower omega-3 content within that cell membrane is going to reduce our ability to actually be anti-inflammatory. And so it takes a long time to see that shift in the actual cell membrane when you start playing around with the different oils that you're taking. But canola is probably going to be the biggest one that I think that we uh, are recommending our patients to stay away from. Okay, that's really helpful because inflammation equals pain for... Uh, it can, yes. Our brain is more likely to um, register a sensation as painful when there is a lot of inflammation associated with it. So I'm curious about the patients that come to see you. I, I, you have to guesstimate here, but how many uh, or what percentage of people would you guesstimate have seen like tons of other doctors and they're coming to you kind of as a last resort, or are people just starting off with you? I would say probably 90% are not starting off with me. 90% is they've gone through the conventional system and they've been, they've either had surgery and surgery didn't work, or they have complications, pain complications from the surgery, or they've been told that, uh, okay, just wait till this gets really bad and then we'll do surgery, or there's nothing we can do for you. You just have to take pain medication. Most, I'd say 90% have gone through that system and are unhappy with the results that they've seen and are looking for an alternative. I'd say that's the boat that Michelle and I are both in right now with our chronic pains, right? You know, when we've gotten all of those responses, and I think that's why it's so amazing, you know, Michelle connected us to you. And But it's really interesting to hear that your approach is, you know, somebody comes to you with chronic pain, the first thing that you're going to do is change the diet, right? Because you know, even my approach, it's been, you know, tear for surgery is a pain pill. So to hear you say, okay, from foods to waters, you know, that's a really drastically different approach to chronic pain versus go buy XYZ or go take these pills, right? So first and foremost. And, but I'm really curious, where do you, is that where you start all of your patients? Like if we're coming to you from chronic pain, what does that look like? You know, Yes, good question. So at this point in my in my career, I have m actually moved away from being the person to give the advice on nutrition because that is very simple stuff at the end of the day that, you know, we've got other people that I can refer out to who can manage those things. I talk a lot about it a lot on social media because it's things that people can do for free. So I've moved away from kind of allowing people to pay me to tell them how to change their diet because there's so much free information that I've put out there on it that they just have to go and do it. And so right now, the main things that I'm doing are the PRP and the stem cell injections because that's not something I can do through social media. I can't, you know, it's a hands-on thing, right? And so generally what happens is most people who come to me, if not probably more than 90%, is we're, do, we're basically working them up to say, is there something, is there a structure that is damaged and your brain is perceiving as painful that I can target with an injection of platelet-rich plasma or stem cell therapy, both of those things coming from the same person who's in pain, in order to help to strengthen those tissues, to reduce inflammation in those tissues, such that things are less painful or not painful anymore. And so our initial appointment is actually a very, very long appointment where we are just trying to figure out why you're still in pain. That's usually for most people anywhere from two to three hours of an appointment where we are just, we're trying to figure out, okay, you've been told that you've got a disc problem in your low back. Is your pain actually from your disc 
or is it from your facet joint or is it from this ligament or is it from your SI joint or is it referring from somewhere else or is this where, hey, you just really need to get a stronger core and there's nothing structurally that I can inject and fix. And so in that case, we would then refer out to physical therapy or things like that. And then with that, we make our recommendations for, okay, now let's talk about your nutrition. Here are some things that you can change. All right, here's some supplements that you can take. Here's some herbs that you can take. Here's a good physical therapist I want you to go see. We still take a very comprehensive approach, but because I am uh, specialized in and I'm, and I'm very good at figuring out why people are in pain and then doing the regenerative injections for that pain, I've uh, really focused in on that area. And what is the difference between why would you use PRP? Like what is PRP? What are stem cells? And why would you choose one over the other? Great question. So PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. So it's a process where we draw a patient's blood we then spin it down in a centrifuge and we extract out a layer that is very rich in platelets. So the plasma has been concentrated and the platelets are very concentrated. So we call platelet rich plasma. Those platelets contain growth factors and other cell signaling molecules that in our bodies naturally will respond to injury. So when we get a cut or we break a bone or any form of injury, our platelets travel to that area they release these growth factors and that actually starts the healing process. So it increases inflammation, which then calls other cells and other growth factors and signaling molecules to that area. They then start the repair process. And then over time, that tissue is going to heal. And so we are basically just taking what the body is already doing, but then we're concentrating it and we're reintroducing it into an area that the body has kind of forgotten about. So that process is not happening anymore when you've had pain for three months, six months, 10 years. And so we're taking those plates, putting them back in, they restart a new healing process. Stem cell therapy is where we are taking tissues from the body. So it's either going to be your bone marrow or it's going to be your fat tissue. So it's either through a bone marrow aspiration or a mini liposuction procedure. Both of those tissues have living stem cells in them. So in the bone marrow, you're going to have your mesenchymal stem cells and then also your hematopoietic stem cells, two types of stem cells that can aid in the healing process. And then in the fat tissue, it's predominantly the mesenchymal stem cell that's present. So we take those tissues and then the same thing, we inject those into an area of injury. Now, it's really fascinating about the stem cells is the platelets are kind of just like, they're like your worker bees. They don't really know what they're doing. They just kind of go and they follow command. So when platelets come into contact with damaged tissue, they recognize that and they just explode over a 10 day period approximately, but they really just release everything they have. The stem cells are fascinating because they've been shown to be able to sense the environment that they are in. So they have these little tentacles on them that they're actually going to say, oh, this tissue here is really inflammatory or there's a low grade infection here or there's a lot of tissue damage. And based on that, the stem cell will then change what it sends out from itself. And it sends out messenger molecules that then go to other cells and it tells cells how to fix the problem that's present there. The other really cool thing that stem cells can do is if there are certain cells that are damaged in the mitochondria, little powerhouse of the cell, if that's damaged, the stem cell can actually donate its mitochondria to the other damaged cell. So that way that damaged cell can now repair itself. So it's, it's really, really, really fascinating. The reason that we choose different between one versus the other, there's a few things that come into play. The first is what the research shows. So we take a very evidence informed uh, approach here in our practice. If we have something that says PRP and stem cell therapy is likely going to work equally, then we're going to choose to use PRP. Stem cell therapy is, uh, is more expensive and it's more invasive. We have to do a bone marrow aspiration or a liposuction procedure compared to just drawing your blood, which is really low risk and, and easy. And so situations like this might be very mild osteoarthritis or very mild um, ligament sprains, like someone who rolls their ankle a lot and now it's just, the ankle just kind of doesn't feel very stable. 
those are situations where PRP has been shown to work basically equally well as the stem cell therapy. So we ought therefore PRP. The other reason, the flip reason is if, if we have evidence showing that when we look at PRP versus stem cell therapy, that stem cell therapy is going to give us better results for longer, then we would talk with the patient about that. Now, the nice thing about these therapies is that in most situations, it's not you have to do this one or you have to do this one where we say, look, the research shows that stem cells work better. So you just have to do this or see you later. It's like, no, this one, the research shows those stem cell therapy, you on average might get three to five years of pain relief and PRP might be one to two years of pain relief. So it's not that like you have to do stem cells or else, or you have to do PRP or else. Both things are working to accomplish the same goal. Just one tends to be stronger than the other. And then the third thing is patient finances. Some patients are blessed and are able to afford doing a stem cell procedure, which can range from ten dollars to $20,000. Other patients are, are not able to do that, and they're looking more at doing PRP, which may be in the range of, of two to four thousand dollars, and so there is a, a price discrepancy there because the stem cell procedures are more invasive; they take longer, they're more advanced, and things like that. And because insurance is not covering for these therapies, you know these are costs that patients are choosing to you know spend their hard-earned money on. And so the financial discussion is happening with every single patient on, hey, here's what we think about PRP, here's what we think about stem cells, here's what you know how this all might play out here are costs, and then we just have an open discussion about that. Why doesn't insurance at least reimburse for part of this, or do you see that happening in the future where, where these types of therapies are going to be covered? I do think at some point they will be, but I don't think that's the solution, to be honest, because as everybody knows, what do insurance companies do? Insurance companies tell doctors what they can and can't do, and they deny care to patients and so you now get into a situation where, okay, maybe PRP gets covered for knee osteoarthritis. If it's going to get covered for anything in the beginning, it's going to be knee osteoarthritis. But he here's part of the problem. A lot of patients who have knee osteoarthritis, the pain that they have, most of it is usually not only coming from inside the joint. Now, when you go to the doctor right now and you get a a hyaluronic acid injection, which is the lubrication, or you get a steroid injection, um, those are only going inside of the joint. And so if somebody has pain from a ligament that's outside the joint and all they get is steroid inside the joint, the steroid inside the joint is not addressing the pain of the ligament that's outside the joint. And so patients go, yeah, you know, it, it kind of worked for a little bit, but didn't really work. And, and then the conventional system goes, well, all right, well, we'll just keep doing this until it's bad enough, then we'll just do a knee replacement. And so if insurance starts to cover PRP, what will likely happen is that they will say, we will cover PRP to go inside the joint, but we're not going to cover anything else because all that other stuff is not proven to work. And so then what happens is now you have where PRP is only going inside the joint. It's not addressing the actual root cause of the pain. And now you have insurance companies saying who gets PRP, who doesn't get PRP. And then you get issues where insurance companies are going to, over time, decrease the reimbursement rates to doctors. They're going to charge more to the patients. And it's frustrating. But at the end of the day, most doctors who are doing orthobiologics don't want insurance to cover these therapies because then it becomes the insurance companies telling me when I can and can't do the thing that I know is going to work for the patient but they don't want to pay for it. And, and surgeons sometimes have the same issues where they know a surgery could be helpful for the patient, but because the patient hasn't done X, Y, Z, or because the, the plan that they have, or because of reimbursement, like there's so many things. The system just needs a freaking overhaul. Like insurance, the way it is, it is going today is not, the only people who are really winning there is the insurance companies who make billions of dollars of profits every year. That's it. Those are the only people who are winning in that scenario. It's not the doctors. It's not the hospitals. It's not, definitely not the patients. So that's my soapbox for the day. That's true. It's, no, I appreciate that. And it, it is maddening, you know, on both sides, the doctors that want to do what they know is going to be the right treatment. And then the patients that are just jumping through rings of fire 
to get the treatment that they really need. And you said PRP is like one to two years, stem cell three to five years of resolution. Do you ever see people cured by one set of injections? Or I don't know how many injections you you do in a normal course of treatment. Yeah, cure is a very, very strong word. So when I'm talking with patients, this is kind of the, the shtick that I usually say. So when we're going in with these therapies, there is the possibility that the body will actually heal the damaged structures. Now, when that healing happens, it will never become perfect. It will never be like it was before the first injury. So as an example, the two discs in my back that I herniated, even if I have stem cell therapy, all the stuff, and I'm a, even if I'm 100% pain-free, the disc will never be like it was before it was injured. It will always be at a disadvantage, which makes me more susceptible to having that degenerate faster and to get injured again. And so the first stem cell procedure I had for my back was back in 2017. In 2017, um, I had a bone marrow procedure for my back and I had about four, four and a half years where, I mean, maybe once a month, I had a little bit of ache in my back, which I mean, who doesn't have a little bit of ache in their back one day out of the month, right? And so for the most part, I was 100% pain-free for four and a half years. And then I injured it in the gym. Now, am I, are we going to argue that the stem cells wore off? No, I would argue that the stem cells didn't wear off. It's just the fact that I'm at a disadvantage in my disc because it has been injured before. So there I then did a few PRP treatments and, and we kind of just, it was end up being symptomatic management for about over a year period. And then about six months ago, um, I had PRP injected inside my disc, which is the first time I've had that done. So I had PRP injected inside my disc, and currently today, I'm 100% better. I don't have any pain. I'm back in the gym. I'm lifting. I feel strong, all of those things. Does that mean I'm cured? Well, for the time being, I have no pain, so am I cured? Okay, maybe you could argue that, but I know that at some point, either I'm going to age so much that my back will start hurting again because those discs are still going to degenerate faster than if they had never been injured, um, or um, also I could get in another car accident and I could injure it. I could injure it in the gym by being active, like all of these things. And so, yes, some patients, they go decades without having any other issues with areas of pain. Um, but in other patients, you know, it might only give them two to three years before their aging process, you know, kind of impacts them. And that we see that more in the, uh, the patients who are older. So in our patients who are in their 50s, 60s, even 70s, you know, we might only get two to three years of relief, but for them that, you know, they're happy with that because the alternative was nothing. The alternative was the doctor saying, sorry, there's nothing we can do about that. You just have to keep suffering. And now they have two years of relief and maybe it's three, three, four thousand dollars that they pay for a PRP treatment every two years. And to them, they look at that and they go, this is worth it. And then they get to, you know, keep doing that. Dr. Timmermans, you said something super interesting in somebody with the disc issues. I just want to be clear on this. You said normally, I guess you've done PRP in your back and it was outside the disc and in the space and then in the bulging area versus inside. What what was that factor that made you decide to go inside the disc? What's, what's going on with this? Good question. Let me phrase this well. So when I was going through my residency, my, uh, my residency director was not convinced on the data for going inside the disc and using PRP or stem cell therapy. So when I was initially trained in injecting the spine and helping patients with low back pain, it was, we don't go in the disc, we stay outside the disc, we put the stem cells around the disc, which is actually what I had done back in 2017 because my residency director did that procedure on me. And if you look at the literature on intradiscal biologics, the first studies were kind of published around 2016. So, you know, at that time point, we didn't have a lot of literature to say, hey, this is safe and that this is efficacious. And so we took the, the stance of, hey, let's take the precautious route and, and kind of not go into that, into the disc. And then um, kind of around, I'll say in 2021, 
at conferences, more people are starting to present on their data for going inside the disk and injecting PRP inside the disk to help with disk herniations and annular fissures or annular tears. Those are the specific things that we're going to use this for. And so I started, my interest started to get peaked, started to dig into the research a little bit more. And then um, in 2022, really did a deep dive into the literature, talked to some colleagues who were doing it and kind of made this, the decision that, hey, I think there's enough evidence here to show that it's safe. I think there's enough evidence here to show that it's efficacious. And then in, in, uh, in 2022, we started uh, doing that in our patients where we started injecting discs in order to, to help heal those annular tears that were really stubborn to heal. Um, and the results have really, really been fantastic. And then when I was not seeing the results that I wanted to, when I was getting PRP just put around my disc, that's when I decided, okay, it was worth going through that procedure myself. That's incredible. So you had your own results and it, you're still recovered basically for now. Yeah. I, I had the procedure done in July and within about three months, I think I would say it was probably September, October ish, where I was back in the gym. I, you know, with physical therapy, right. This is not just like get an injection and you're, you're good to go. Like I still have to work on my core stability. I still have to make sure my hips are strong, all of these types of things. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm back squatting and back deadlifting, um, back doing hip thrusts and, you know, the, the, I'll say maybe one to two days a month, um, it's a little irritated and I just take it easy that day in the gym. But other than that, I'm 95% pain free. It's so great to hear. And it sounds like after your injections or, you know, any patient's injections, the healing kind of comes on slowly. So it's not just like I'm fixed. But over the next couple of weeks, you just start noticing, oh, okay, I can move easier. I'm not noticing. I'm not focused on the pain because that's what we tend to do when we have pain. It's like, that's all you can think about is the pain. Yeah. Yeah. So um, patients who have had steroid injections in the past kind of know that, you know, you get the steroid injection and then sometimes it takes a week or two to set in, but like then it sets in, it's like, boom, it's like fantastic, Right. And the pain relief with steroids can be very fantastic. There's just a lot of downsides that occur with the steroids. You can have systemic things. So it's really hard on the adrenal glands. Um, it can be really hard on uh, blood sugar and things like that. And then some patients get really bad insomnia and they just don't want um, to have those types of side effects. There's also a lot of emerging literature to show that when you inject high doses of steroids into areas that they can actually degrade the tissue that it's injected into. And so one of the worst examples is, is the hips. If, if a doctor injects a high dose of steroids into the hips, there's a 5% chance, which is very high in medicine. A 5% chance of a complication is very high. There's a 5% chance that you're going to get something called avascular necrosis, which is basically rapid deterioration of the hip joint, which then means you need a hip replacement. There's a 5% chance that happens if you get a steroid injection in the hip. That is scary. Right. And so, and so a lot of people are, are, you know, are trying to move away from it for that reason. But with the PRP, the stem cell therapy, most of the time what happens because we're actually getting healing of these tissues and healing actually takes time is it takes sometimes two to three months to really realize how well the injections are working. Now, there are some caveats to that. There are some of the injections that we do. So one is called alpha two macroglobulin but also our bone marrow procedures, there are certain proteins that are found within bone marrow and alpha-2 macroglobulin that are natural anti-inflammatories, and those can actually work really, really quickly. So as an example, I've been having some uh, labral issues in my left shoulder, and three days ago, I had a, an A2M procedure, which is where we take the plasma, we don't take the platelets, but we take the plasma, we remove the water, and it concentrates all the proteins that are found in the plasma. One of those proteins is, is called A2M. A2M helps to break down inflammatory products that are inside of our joints. And it's been three days and I'm about 90% better. Now that usually lasts anywhere from 12 to 18 months, but um, you know it's a really good option because it has similar uh, uh, efficacy to steroids, but it doesn't degrade the cartilage. It doesn't degrade the tissues. Does it cause insomnia, blood pressure, or sorry, blood sugar issues, and all of those types of things? And so, some patients, when we do these injections, 
they feel really, really good afterwards and that stays. And then they see healing over a longer time period. You doing these injections on yourself? Here, like I'll take a little, oh, I bit, of this, a little bit of that. I, I have trust in people uh, like my resident who does these injections. I have injected myself, but most of these days it's other people injecting me. I would find that so tempting. I'm like, hmm, got a little bit of a neck ache today. I got a little PRP going. <laughs> yeah, this is incredible. I mean, for all of our listeners out there, I mean, this just sounds like for people who really live in chronic pain, and I think Michelle and I have both been there, I mean, this just sounds kind of like a dream come true. And it's just so many people out there sit and search for what can they do, you know, and you just really feel like you're out of you're out of options. And now it's, you know, just go, let's go find a naturopathic physician. And I know it's not that easy, right? And now you're not licensed in every state now. So, you know, how do we find the Dr. Timmermans of Arizona? you know, everywhere, right? I mean, this isn't easy. I mean. Yeah, probably about close to half of our patients travel from out of state. And we've had a few from, a bunch from Canada. And then we've had a few from Europe come over as well, just because it is, it's really hard to find good people. And obviously I'm, I'm biased to, I think the way that we do things is, is high quality. And so the, what I try to, educate people on what they should be looking for. The biggest things that I, I really try to teach what, uh, what are red flags on a provider that maybe um, is not taking enough time or is maybe doing regenerative medicine and they're just doing it for on the financial side and things like that. So the first one is physicians who over rely on imaging and downplay the importance of a physical assessment, a hands-on physical assessment I think that's one, probably one of the biggest red flags. So if anybody is, let's say you're calling a local clinic and saying, hey, I've got back pain, you know, um, what what are options available for PRP and stem cell therapy? And if the doctor is going to tell you exactly what's going to be done just based off your x-ray or your MRI, that's a big red flag. Because as we kind of talked earlier about the knee osteoarthritis example, you could have an MRI that says you have knee osteoarthritis but that could actually be not causing your pain whatsoever. Your knee pain could be coming from something else. It could be coming from your back. It could be a referral pattern from your hip. You just also happen to have knee osteoarthritis. And so the physical assessment is so critical. And it's the number one reason why, you know, um, I don't do telehealth. People say, oh, like Dr. T, I just, I want to talk to you because I know you can tell me why I'm in pain. It's just like, I can only do that with confidence when I can get my hands on somebody because I need to move the joint, I need to feel the tissues, I need to do these things, and imaging just doesn't tell us the whole story. So that's the first red flag. The second big one is um, if places are not using image guidance for their injections. And what I mean by that is there are some places out there where they uh, don't use ultrasound or x-ray to guide the needle safely and accurately to the target that you want. It is not as accurate to just, you know, feel the back and then put a needle in the back. It's also, there's increased risk of that because you can't see where that needle is going and it could go somewhere where you don't want it to go, but you also can't see that where the needle is going. So you can't accurately say that this got into the area that we wanted it to get into. And so in our practice, we use both x-ray and ultrasound in general, as long as somebody is using one, um, that's usually sufficient. Um, for spine related cases, there's an argument to be made for using x-ray, but the hard thing with x-ray is that you can't see soft tissues. So you can't see the ligaments, uh, you can't see nerves, things like that, that often need to be treated in these really complex, uh, and, uh, chronic cases. The last one is, you know, how much time is, is somebody going to spend with you? You know, there are some clinics out there where they're still only going to spend 15 minutes with you. And they're gonna, you know, still want it, you to spend five to ten thousand dollars on an injection, but they're only spending fifteen minutes with you. Our physical exam for someone with, you know, uh, a complicated history, you know, they've seen a lot of doctors, they've had a lot of things, they've tried a lot of things. The physical assessment alone sometimes might be thirty minutes. You can't fit that into a fifteen-minute appointment because you need to learn about the patient, you need to hear about their pain, you need to then do the physical exam. We do a lot of diagnostic ultrasound evaluation. So that might take 20 to 30 minutes. And then you have to talk about the options because that talking about options is a two-way street. This is not the old school medicine of you need surgery. 
schedule. This is like, hey, here are different things that you could do. This is your money that you're spending. Let's talk about that. And because it, it has to be a good shared decision. And so those are kind of the red flags that you're looking for in terms of, you know, what to look for when you're trying to find somebody who might be local. Yeah, you guys, I can't recommend highly enough to go to Dr. Timmerman's Instagram. There is so much information. You'll get a pep talk every time you go there. You might get a little kick in the butt too sometimes, but it's with love and it's just so like you don't feel so alone with your pain, just hearing the messaging and also knowing that you've gone through your own chronic pain really, it really means a lot because you get it. You know, I feel sometimes when you when you don't get it, you just don't get it. And I've seen plenty of those doctors that the way they've treated me, like obviously you've never been in chronic pain. Yeah. And I also I, I try to also push people to my YouTube a lot because of the search function. I have like 1800 videos, I think, at this point on on YouTube. And so, you know, if you search like shoulder pain or knee osteoarthritis or low back pain, like you search that within my channel and you're going to get a huge list of videos that, you know, it's very low sales pitchy and very high educational content because I just, I want to help people. And I know that not everybody can afford to work with me. And so I do my best to try to help educate on things people can do. Um, and then if they can work with me, great. Or if they can find somebody local so they don't have to travel, great. But there's a ton, ton of education on YouTube on my channel. I think we know what we're doing right after we get off this podcast, right, Ryan? Exactly. You like exactly. obsessively on YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Timmermans, thank you so much for being here and sharing all of this valuable information and just guiding our listeners on, you know, what is naturopathic medicine and really um, showcasing how it is as um, relevant, even though all the states don't approve it, you know, not but how to actually help our listeners go out and find an actual naturopathic physician who has the credentials um, and being very careful about that. I think transparency in this space is, is critical, actually. So all the work that you're doing, I mean, for somebody who has chronic pain, I think it's just important to follow the right people and listen to the right message. Uh, I think that's really important. But we ask all of our guests on the show to share three fundamental pillars that contribute to your well-being. Can you share your three fundamental pillars with us? Three fundamental pillars is to spend more time with people who fill your cup up and who make you like you walk away being like, I just I feel better after talking to that person, spending time with that person. Those positive interactions that we have in life are so crucial, especially today in our very fragmented and disconnected world. So that's one. Um Two is uh, going to be uh, some form of spirituality. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's religious. It can mean it's religious to people. It doesn't have to be, but just some way of connecting to either a higher power or just the universe itself, I think is so, so crucial. And again, so just over overlooked in today's tech society. And then the third is uh, spending more time in nature is you know, more sunshine, more feet, bare feet on the ground, just the outdoors. I love that. Those are all things we can, we can do immediately. They're all free. And they're all free. Yeah. That's right. You talked about your YouTube. I've mentioned your Instagram and your website. Where can people find you specifically? What's your handle and the name of your website? How do we? So website is Regenerative Performance, which is the name of our practice on YouTube if you search Regen Performance or you just search my name, Drew Timmermans, I'll come up. And then Instagram is at Dr. Drew Timmermans. I recently changed it from just Regen Performance. But if you search Drew Timmermans, I will come up and you'll find me. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your time today. And I know our listeners really appreciate hearing from you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Timmermans. Thanks so much for listening. This has been Sophia Unfiltered, a podcast by Sophia Health, the number one marketplace for health and wellness. Find services, classes, and products from the top health and wellness providers. Book an appointment or join live classes now. I'm your host, Riley Reese. If this episode resonated with you, we'd love to hear about it in the comment section of your favorite podcast provider or with a five-star rating. Let us know what your biggest takeaway from this episode was or share it with someone you hope to inspire. Join us again next time for more real conversations, stories, and insights that help empower you with the knowledge and inspiration needed to transform how we care for ourselves.